This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. It's been said, the heavens are God's billboard, that God communicates by signs in the sky. In the book of Revelation, the Apostle John tells us, the sun will become black, while the moon, it will turn red like blood. In the years 2014 and 2015, a lunar tetrad will occur on what many recognize as Israel's holy days. Some have heralded this lunar tetrad to be the blood moons of your Bible. Can this be true? Is this lunar tetrad actually a harbinger of chaos and devastation reserved for the Jewish people and perhaps the rest of the world? Stay with us as we attempt to answer these questions on today's program. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Bill Watson. Well, again, welcome to another international telecast of the Armor of God. Good to be with all of you once more. You know, by now, you're probably becoming familiar with a few terms that are actually gaining quite prominence and popularity due to men like Mark Blitz and John Hagee, who have written books and hit the speaking circuit, along with many others who are filling the, the areas of YouTube and, of course, the Internet with information pertaining to these terms that I want want to take some time to clarify for the benefit of all of us so that we can have a bit more of a balanced outlook on what these terms really mean and what kind of impact they're going to have on our modern time and day and age. Because a lot of these individuals are actually beginning now to draw attention to the fact that allegedly this term that I'm going to introduce to you is indicative of, it's even an omen, some consider it an omen, as was pointed out in our opening there, that God's wrath, that some horrific and terrible things are going to occur because of these events that these terms that I'm about to introduce to you you are indicative of. What is the term that I want to introduce to you? Well, the first one is a term called blood moons. What are blood moons? What is the significance that they represent? Why is there such interest in these astronomical signs? These are good questions and certainly legitimate questions. Why do I say that? Because these are real astronomical phenomena. They are actually really going to happen. And unfortunately though, some Christian ministers and some Christian ministries and other commentators and individuals that are pontificating ideas are now attempting to try to tie in this term blood moon into prophetic writings like Joel in the book of Joel or in the book of Revelation from the Apostle John, that these are indicative of coming catastrophes and calamities that are going to impact our families and our lifestyles and in some cases whole nations of people. And I dare say, and unfortunately I say this kind of sadly, that I'm sure people are going to grab this hook, line, and sinker, as they would say, and begin to make long-term decisions in their life about investments, perhaps spending money on items of protection or survival that, frankly, I hope you will begin to understand as you come more to grips with a more balanced view on this is also unnecessary. 
Because you see, most people don't even realize this, but I want to share this with you, that actually we have two blood moons every year. Oh yeah, that's right, two blood moons every year. There's a blood moon in the southern hemisphere, and there's a blood moon in the northern hemisphere. And it's due to the fact that, and I'm sure you don't recognize this because most people don't, but yet it is common knowledge among those who do know this, that all full moons from every month or for every month have a name. Here in North America, you can trace back some of the origins of naming the full moon to the month by virtue of our native Indian population. And many of the Europeans just went ahead and adopted those names and have basically kept them. Matter of fact, let me give you a for instance on this. Notice this, I picked this up off the Farmer's uh, Almanac. Here in the month of January, you have the full moon named Wolf Moon. In February, it's named Snow Moon. Now over in the Southern Hemisphere, January is named a Buck Moon, and in February, it's Red Moon. Now in the fall, in the Northern Hemisphere, you have what's called the Harvest Moon, and the Harvest Moon is the month of September, followed by, listen to this now, followed by the Blood Moon, which oftentimes is called also a Hunter's Moon. In the Southern Hemisphere, you have the same thing, but different months, because again, the Southern Hemisphere is opposite. It is the mirror reflection of the Northern Hemisphere, so you have the Harvest Moon in March and the Blood Moon in April. But here's the problem. I think you can already begin to see that we have a misappropriation of terms going on here that is generating a lot of hyperbole. And unfortunately, due to this misdirected information, is causing a lot of unnecessary anxiety and stress and concern due to the exploitation efforts of certain ones that are attempting to tie this in to biblical prophetic statements located in the prophets, like the book of Joel primarily, as well as uh, the book of Revelation written by the apostle John. So I want to take some time. I want to take some time today to go through this blood moon idea, this blood moon term. But before I do, let me interrupt myself, as we usually do, to go ahead and introduce to you our two free offers. And I emphasize free offers. Both of them are for your obtaining. All you've got to do is call the operator there at 888-578-8791. Ask her for the two items that we're offering. They are both pieces of literature. One is called the coming blood moons. What are they? and evidence of the end times. Both are very complementary to this particular presentation on today, and you really do need to get them so that you can be better suited, better armed, better prepared to be able to handle the onslaught of information that I know you're going to be introduced to over the next two years of 2014 and 2015. So dial that number, 888 Ask the operator for the coming blood moons, what are they? And evidence of the end times. Both are free. And don't forget about that website, by the way, at www.cgi.org and our webcasting feature that we have there every Saturday. All you've got to do is go to that home page and hit on the link there and see what time it's going to be broadcast. And you can go ahead and rendezvous there with us every Saturday and listen to a live presentation by an individual talking about the Word of God or some kind of perhaps cultural concern that we may have facing our society today. So one more time now, 888 for the free offers, the coming blood moons, what are they? And of course the second one, evidence of the end times. And that website, one more time, www.cgi.org. Now, let's get back to the program. And again, I just want to remind you that what we're talking about here, and for those of you who have just come on board to uh, watch what we're talking about, we're talking about this term called blood moons. And there's a couple of terms that I, I want to introduce to you, but we've been primarily focused on this first term called blood term, uh, blood moons, that is. That, that's the term that we're talking about. And, and in this respect, I, I can't help but to hearken back to again remind us that blood moons happen 
two times a year, once in the Southern Hemisphere and once in the Northern Hemisphere. As a matter of fact, I remember when I used to travel quite a bit as an industrial sales engineer, coming home sometimes on a Friday night, driving down the freeway or just traveling from a city to another city in the evening as the sun was setting and dusk wasn't even complete. There would be a low horizon moon rising, and I'd see that big moon. You know, I used to always call it a harvest moon because, frankly, I didn't even understand or hear of the term blood moon until here recently. So I used to always call September a harvest moon, October a harvest moon. I mean, that's just the way I was. But I can't help but to admit that many times that moon looked like a pumpkin color, you know, kind of an orange pumpkin looking color, sometimes a little darker. I'd have to admit also that there were times when it looked a little bit more orangey than usual and or even rusty orange. And also admittedly, I'd have to say, even on occasion, maybe a handful of times, I'd have to say, yeah, you know what? It did have a bit of a reddish tint. Now, I could use all kinds of astronomical terms and uh, kind of confuse most of you uh, on why that is, but let me just say this. When you're looking longer through the, to the horizon on a more horizontal angle, you're looking through more atmosphere. You're looking through more air, and that just has the effect of this discoloration of the moon. And I say that to illustrate the fact that that is somewhat of a true phenomena that occurs simply because as the moon rises higher in the air, it begins to that, uh, lose that color, it dissipates, and it begins to turn its normal kind of chalky white, uh, eggshell white that many of us are used to. But here's my point, and this is all that I'm trying to say. Blood moons are not necessarily all that uncommon. They happen two times a year. And so what I'm trying to impart here to all of us, it's not that big of a deal. Now, that brings me to the second term. The second term is a bit of a bigger deal and gives, I guess what you could say, some license for some of these exploiters and charlatans to perhaps attempt to spin the information in hopes to add leverage to you doing something that they want you to do, whether it's buy their book, buy their gold, their silver, their food, uh, dehydrated, or maybe their silo or bomb shelter. Nevertheless, point being is the second term is this, lunar tetrad. That's right, lunar tetrad. Now what is a lunar tetrad? Let me go ahead and read the definition of what that is. A lunar tetrad is this, very simply, four successive total key lunar eclipses, key operative lunar eclipses with no partial eclipse in between and of which are separated from the other six months other six full moons in between that happen two years in a row. This is what a lunar tetrad is. That's right, my friends. Basically, four total full moons over two consecutive years. That illustrates the fact that it is two distinct things, my friends, two distinct things. You have blood moons and you have, of course, lunar tetrads. You are not going to find any astronomer describing the lunar eclipses, the total lunar eclipses that are going to be occurring in 2014 and 2015 and describe them as blood moons. That's just really a kind of a misnomer. They're lunar eclipses, plain and simple. Now, what has happened here over the years and what some have tried to draw the attention to is that the lunar eclipse, though totally different, in this particular case happens rarely. And admittedly, it does. Case in point, over the next 100 years or now let's say about 87 years because we've been in the 21st century now for about 13 or 14 years if uh, you're seeing this program in 2014 and one year less if you're watching it in 2015. But my point is that yes, the lunar tetrad occurs rarely comparably speaking to the total amount of lunar, uh, lunar eclipses. And in this particular case, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but in the 21st century, we will have a total of eight lunar tetrads. That's right, eight of them. There will be four full total lunar eclipses over a span of two years 
eight times this year. And do you know what? One has already occurred. In the year 2003 and 2004, we had four total lunar eclipses six months apart. And guess what? Nothing really happened. Well, I mean, that's relatively speaking. A lot of things have happened. The world we live in is volatile. But the bottom line is nothing like what is attempting to be allegedly to occur over the next lunar tetrad in the 21st century, which is coming in 2014. But notice, not only 2014 and 2015 is the second tetrad or lunar tetrad that's going to occur, but there's going to be a third one in the year 2032 and 33 and 2043 and 44 and 2050 and 51 and 2060 and 62 and as you can see 72 and 73 and 90 and 91 so by now you can be wondering well why are people making an issue out of this then bill ah here is the reason why because specifically this particular time in the year 2014 and 2015, this lunar tetrad is going to occur on the Israelitish, or some would say Jewish, holy days. That's right. In this particular case, 2014, the first full lunar eclipse will occur on what is called the first day of unleavened bread or as some would identify it as the Jewish Passover. And the second one will occur on the first day of what is called the Feast of Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles in 2014. In 2015 the pattern will be repeated and again the lunar tetrad will occur this what you could say uh, full eclipse, total lunar eclipse will occur uh, at that time on these particular uh, holy days. Now, so what is so special about that? Well, it gets a bit more fine-lined, a, a bit more technical in this respect. Only eight, or only seven times, my friends, seven times has this occurred in the last 2,000 years. In that particular case, some have said this is an astronomical anomaly. Well, maybe so. Some have also attempted to tie certain key geopolitical benchmark events tied to and associated with, in particular, the Jewish people, as well as even Christians, over those first seven tetrads that occurred on Jewish holy days over the last 2,000 years since A.D. 1 until our day. Now, when you add that, and, and we're going to put up on the screen this one thing, because I just wanted to show you real quickly here uh, those years that this particular tetra, these particular tetrads occurred. 162, 63, you can see, uh, occurred. 795 and 796, 842 and 843, 860 and 861. 1493 and 1494, now we come into a more modern time when Columbus discovered America, although he discovered America in 1492, at least that's what we're talking Old in our history books, but it is a fact that uh, Isabella and the King Fernando uh, of Spain went ahead and pushed all the Jews out of Spain in 1949 and 50. Some are trying to say that Israel became an independent state. However, the official date, of course, many of us are well aware, was 1948. So they're off about a year or so uh, in that respect. But the bottom line is that just happens to be uh, the way it is. But more so in this particular case, and what some have attempted to try to say as well, is two additional items of concern are adding what some believe are additional significance to this tetrad of 2014 and 15 that deserves your attention and, of course, drama associated with it that they leverage by virtue of these two additional reasons. And that is, one, they're happening, of course, on the holy days of the Jewish people, Passover and the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. But secondly, this will be the only one in the 21st century, and it happens to be the eighth time in the last 2,000 years that a lunar tetrad has occurred on the holy days. Now those of you 
probably are wondering, well, what does that have to do with the price of putty? Well, those of you who are interested in and are aware of biblical numerology, you may know that the number eight represents new beginnings. It represents change or commencement, like number three uh, uh, represents completeness, or number seven represents perfection. Uh, number nine is the number of man. Number 12 is the beginning of perfect governmental beginnings, 12 apostles, 12 tribes of Israel, and so forth. And you have these numerology factors involved that essentially give people license to go ahead and claim that, well, in this particular case, uh, we are cruising for something that is going to be far more substantial this time because this is the eighth time and the number eight represents change and represents commencement and represents a new beginning for something. And you know what? I concur. That's right. I agree. There will be, from now until the time Jesus Christ returns, no ceasing of the ongoing development of geopolitical problems and difficulties, horrific events and terrible destruction, chaos and calamities that will indeed result in red moons, will indeed result in a black sun and a river being dried up and billions of people being killed until finally Christ lands on the Mount of Olives. But here's the question, my friends. Is that what's going to happen in the year 2014 and 2015, as some would like you to believe? Let me take you back here to the book of Joel, chapter 2. I'm already there for the sake of time. And let me just read to you for a moment the verses that are often cited to describe the connection of the blood moons of 2014 and 2015 with the book of Joel. Here you read, and notice the context. First of all, right off the bat, the context. The context is essentially the tribulations, and really, you're right up on the threshold of the return of Jesus Christ. You are told here in verse 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness, a black sun, and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come. And it goes on here in verse 32, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said, and the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now the translators made the Bible divided into chapters and verses. This was just essentially a scroll. I'm just going to keep reading here. Notice this, For behold, in those days, what days? The days we're talking about. Behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. You see that? In other words, the Jews are going to be coming out of captivity at the time of these blood moons, of these blackened suns. The Jews, because they will be coming out of captivity under the leadership of Jesus Christ, who will be landing on the planet after all the armies accrue and collect in the Valley of Jehoshaphat for the Battle of Armageddon. So, are you trying to tell me that the Battle of Armageddon is about to occur in the years 2014 and 2015? Well, of course not. And admittedly, many of those that are indeed promoting the attention to blood moons are not necessarily advancing that perspective. But all I'm trying to do, my friends, is add a bit of balance to some of this interpretation that oftentimes so wildly just gets slung here and slung there and oftentimes does nothing but confuse people and get them unnecessarily upset and filled with stress, which we all have enough of in handling things just in our own daily lives, let alone having to worry about the world ending or all hell breaking loose and our lifestyles and our cultures going down the tubes. Oh, don't get me wrong, those things are indeed going to occur in time. But all I'm saying is there are sequences, there are uh, timelines, events that need to unfold to bring you along this saga that is in your Bible. Notice over here real quickly in the book of Revelation chapter 6, I want to just bring this to your attention as pointed out before, stating to you that there are listings of blood moons and darkened suns and so on. Here talking about the sixth seal, we read, and lo there will be a great earthquake and a sun that becomes black as sackcloth of hair and the moon shall become as blood. Did you notice that? 
stars of heaven will fall under the earth a fig tree, uh, as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when it, she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman hid himself in the dens and the rocks and the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. The apostle goes on to write, and he talks about, for the great day of his wrath is come. You read over here in Revelation chapter 9 about the sixth angel regarding the sixth trumpet. I just read you the sixth seal. This is the sixth trumpet. Those of you who are familiar perhaps with the, uh, the book of Revelation understand that there are three sets of seven. You have the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven last plagues. In this particular case, this is the middle sector of seven. The sixth trumpet stated this, that notice in verse 18, by these three, the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone, one third of mankind is killed. And that's one one third of the remaining three fourths because one fourth of mankind was killed up there in the fourth seal previous in chapter 6 to this in Revelation chapter 9. So what am I saying? I'm saying, my friends, blood moons in the year 2014 and 2015, yes, they are definitely, definitely going to occur. Will they be the omens, the harbingers, of certain events that are going to be horrific and, and horrible and destructive and filled with calamity and chaos for the people of Israel and the rest of the world? Frankly, I don't know. But what I do know is this. They will be nothing compared to what I just read you. If anything, at best, what they will be is they will be the beginning of many, many more sorrows to come. My friends, get the literature right now. Dial 888 8791 and get what we're offering to all of you today with regards to today's program. Blood moons. What are they? An evidence of the end times. Both are free for the asking. All you've got to do is dial that number. You need the additional details so that at least you can go through the year 2014 and 2015 without having to have too much angst and additional stress by many of these charlatan opportunists who want to just sell you their books and make money off of you in one way, shape, or form. My friends, dial 888 87 91 ask the operator for both of these free offers my friends this is Bill Watson and as we often do I just want to remind all of you you keep on that armor of God and in so doing don't allow yourself to be affected or impacted by so much of this noise and distortion and hyperbole. Oh yes, I'm not saying something might not happen. We live in volatile times. Anything can happen at any time. But again, let me remind you, if something does indeed happen, it will be the beginning, the beginning of many, many more sorrows. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas 75701 or call toll free at 1-888-578-8791 or call 1-903-939-2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers.